welcome everybody. Uh, good evening to those of you guys joining us from China and uh, throughout Asia. And good morning if you're joining us from North America. And hello from all, uh, for all of you guys uh, from all around the world. Um, my name is Devin Lau. I am the Assistant Director of Yale Center Beijing. Uh, and I wanted to welcome everybody to uh, today's talk on uh, the nature of genius uh, with Professor Craig Wright. Um, it is uh, going to be quite a fascinating talk, um, as I'm sure you guys are all already aware of. Um, uh, some housekeeping uh, before we get started. Uh, I am wonderful to see so many people on. If you are willing and able to, uh, I would ask that you please turn on your webcam. Um, and, you know, uh, this is, we're on now on almost two years now of Zooming and uh, as you all know, it's quite hard uh, to be doing Zoom and not being able to see who you're talking to. Um, and so as much as possible, we like to um, make it seem like uh, we're all in the same room uh, together. So uh, please, if you're able to, that would be very helpful if you can turn on your webcam. Um, also, we will take a group photo together uh, at the end. So um, that's always nice um, to be able to have something to remember our time together by. Um, quick introduction, since I see some new people today. Um, Yale Center Beijing uh, is Yale's first and only university-wide center uh, established in 2014. Um, uh, our goal is to bring the best of Yale to China uh, to showcase uh, the many wonderful research uh, opportunities that and um, <clears throat> different things that are going on at Yale. Uh, and during the normal pandemic of uh, pre-pandemic times, uh, professors and alumni uh, would gather uh, at the center in Beijing. Um, but of course, with uh, COVID, we've been doing many Zoom talks and we've had uh, quite the spectrum of talks from uh, music to art, to philosophy, uh, to economics, um, to many of the different sciences. Um, but today we have a very interesting talk that in a way highlights and uh, brings all those together uh, as we talk about the nature of genius. Um, and, and that's a way to kind of uh, talk about all the things we've been talking about in, in one lecture in, in a way. Uh, so today we are very lucky to have Professor Craig Wright. Uh, he, of course, uh, many of you probably know him from his music appreciation course, uh, Listening to Music, which is one of the most popular online Yale courses uh, in China, especially. Um, uh, but today he will be sort of broadening that uh, to encompass a lot more than just music. Uh, Professor Craig Wright studied piano and music history at the Eastman School of Music before earning his master's and PhD in musicology at Harvard. He is a longtime professor at Yale where he served as chair of the Department of Music uh, and is currently the Henry L. and Lucy G. Moses Professor Emeritus of Music. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the music world, he is one of the few individuals to be awarded the Dent Medal, Einstein Prize, and the King Kedley Award. For those less familiar with the music world, myself included, uh, he has also been a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as the National Endowment of the Humanities Fellowship, as well as an honorary doctor of humane letters from the University of Chicago. So many, many awards. Uh, he himself, uh, I would say, uh, could qualify as a genius, and so a very appropriate person to be leading us uh, on this journey. And and um, and so, without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor Craig Wright. Well, thank you, Devin. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you for your colleagues who have done the work to set this up from a technological uh, point of view. And first, uh, truth in advertising here, full disclosure, I am no genius. You were kind enough to equate me with that word, but when I first told our then almost grown four children that I was going to teach a course at Yale on genius, and write a book on genius, they thought that was the funniest darn thing that they'd ever heard. <laughs> you, you're no genius. You're a plotter. You're a plotter. 
and and that's that's more or less on point. Um, but what we're going to do today, we're going to try a, a PowerPoint. I have some slides prepared for you. We are going to talk. I will talk with you for about 40 minutes. Then we will stop. We will have questions and answers. I think Devin is going to be uh, moderating those through the chat box. Uh, so if you have questions, is that correct, Devin? Post them in chat. That's right. Yes. All right, so I hope that looks all right for you. And I'm going to start out here. And as you can see, I've got a, a plan for today. We're going to talk about what is genius, then about culture and the notion of genius. And we're going to talk about the habits of genius and thinking like a, a genius. And I've written a book on this um, uh, subject, and you can see it on the screen there, The Hidden Habits of, of Genius. It was published uh, by Harper Collins, a, a, um, a renowned publisher, actually the oldest American uh, publisher, uh, based in New York City, Lower Manhattan, a wonderful publisher. Uh, and it came out in uh, last year. But I was pleased to see, and I shared this with Devin just this week, I got a copy, uh, the frontispiece of this. So the book is being uh, translated into Chinese as well. Now, if you are on this call today, you can read this book. <laughs> I'm sure you can read the English just fine. Um, and, uh, uh, but you now have, if you wish, uh, in China, uh, access to this. Uh, Devin tells me that this is in what's called the simple Chinese characters. Is that correct, Devin? Simplified, yep. Simplified, simplified. Okay, so um, of course it's all very complex to me. It's anything but simple, but um, there we have it. So you can engage this in one of, of two forms, I'm delighted to say, uh, through the marvels of modern technology. Exactly when this will be available, I don't know. I've just been given this copy to review a few things, um, and that's all I know at this point. But presumably within the immediate future, it will be available. Um, here's what I'd like to do today. I'm going to move this box over here just a bit. Oh, you just muted yourself. That. All right. Sorry. Um, you can see this slide here. What we're hoping to do is have a discussion. I'm here, and I always thought the best teaching was this kind of teaching. I'm here to provoke you uh, to think about different things. We like to use the word expression critical thinking. Uh, in American colleges. I think we should do a lot more critical thinking. But the point of this is not for me to hand you, as they say, a nugget of wisdom, but set up a series of questions that will engage you and we can collectively, collectively have a discussion. Uh, the, how did I, I'm gonna go to this button here, see if I can get this to change, there we go. How did I, a music professor, get interested in the subject of genius? Well, I was always interested in Mozart um, and uh, I would go around the world studying the autographed manuscripts of Mozart. I'd go to Poland and Germany and Austria, of course, uh, in Paris, there's a lot in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, New York City, Washington, DC. And I got very interested in autograph manuscripts. And then I started once I was in Florence working there and I got interested in the autograph manuscripts of Leonardo da Vinci. And then I began reading the biography of, of I, um, Albert Einstein, and I began to see commonalities between Mozart, da Vinci, and Einstein. Well, if you're going to be in the sciences, well, who is the one person who has won two Nobel Prizes in two separate scientific fields? Well, that is Marie Curie, which took me then on to the subject of, well, why so few women recognized as geniuses uh, to a writing of Virginia Woolf, where she talks exactly about that pro um, pro issue, why women have been marginalized. Well, if you're going to deal with marginalized people, um, then we better uh, broaden our perspective and deal with uh, Blacks in America, African America, uh, uh, heroes and ultimately to people with so-called disabilities. But then when is a so-called disability actually an enabler? And I found many, many cases of that. Um, as Seth mentioned, I'm no genius here, but I've come to see that the uh, uh, oftentimes in life, if you are, if you're very, very good at doing something, you may not be the best at analyzing how that something gets done. 
You're so you're so talented and so gifted at doing it. You just do it. You don't think about how you how you do it. And um, so I, in in my career, have been watching uh, people. Um, and uh, uh, I'm now a first name basis with four Nobel Prize winners. But I was surprised how little they thought about the process of what they were doing. And they came to see, well, I can analyze this probably better than they can. So sometimes in life, uh, you can see better, I think, if you're not in the middle of things. Maybe distance gives you greater clarity. Uh, let's begin here with you. Here's a, um, um, I'm sure that you're, you may or may not be going to raise your hand. We could see all of you. This is a joke, but are you a genius? Well, maybe you are a genius. Maybe you are a genius. Um, but then that raises the question, well, what is a genius? Um, and I would ask each of you uh, to think about that. I'm told that in uh, the Chinese language, the word is slightly different and you would know far better than I about this, but the word, it gets closer to heaven sent child. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it is a, slight, it is a slight, slightly different, uh, slightly nuanced and different um, way of express, expressing that concept. So each individual is encouraged to have his or her own definition of what genius is. But we, and we would love to, and when I teach this course at Yale, we would spend a full week talking just about this topic and we would get everyone engaged and set up different thought problems that would, uh, uh, work them through to their own definition. Well, we don't have all of that time, so I'm going to give you one person's definition uh, just for uh, today. A genius is a person of extraordinary mental powers whose original works or insights change society in some significant way for good or for ill across time and across culture. Okay, that's just one person's definition, and it's a long one. But let's uh, zero in on a couple of key points there. One of the uh, implicit questions here is change society, the whole idea of novelty versus creativity. You can think of something novel. Have you ever seen anyone dressed like this in on the streets of Beijing? I was there once, spent uh, 10 glorious days there, and I never saw anyone dressing like this, but somebody once designed dresses to look like this. That was not novel, but I would contend it's not creative because it didn't change anything. To be creative requires that an idea has impact. It changes society in some fashion or other for good or for ill. Well, we could all think about that exactly. And it, supposing you could change society, but do so in a destructive way. And we could all name our uh, most infamous uh, characters, uh, uh, individuals such as uh, this. Let me say, get the, uh, what would we do with this person? Would we consider this person a genius or simply a sociopath and not a genius? Well, it depends on how you define genius. Does the genius do only good or can you be a genius and do both good and ill? Uh, across culture and across time. Well, here we see on the left, some examples of penicillin, an antibiotic. On the right, we have some tennis shoes designed by current uh, hip hop and rap artist Kanye West. These boost tennis shoes by Yeezy tennis shoes, they're, they're called. I, they may or may not be available in China, I'm not sure. But I know that penicillin is available in China, manufactured in China. And I, uh, I, I suspect that there are many more people have been impacted by penicillin. I read that 200 million lives have been saved through penicillin, but these easy tennis shoes are expensive. They cost $500 in some cases, and um, many people around the world do not want to spend $500 on tennis shoes, so they have a very limited distribution and they wear out. Tennis shoes may last six months. Penicillin has been with us now 80 years, so it is duration across time. Okay, so here is my definition once again. A genius is a person of extraordinary mental powers whose original works or insights change society in some significant way ever good across it all. Over the period of time, I came to realize working with students 
that that definition is too long and cannot be remembered. It's, a, it's, it's not good teaching, um, which causes me to remember something that Albert Einstein said. He said, a genius is someone who takes a very complex idea and turns it into a simple one. And that's true with mathematical formulas. And Einstein came up with this famous formula for atomic energy, as you know, E equals mc squared. So let me, in the spirit of Einstein here, uh, allow myself, the non-genius Craig, to come up with my own formula to simplify things. G equals S times N times D. Genius equals significance times the number of people impacted times the duration of the impact. So in that sense, we can, for better or for worse, we can quantify it and we could even give points and we could even rate geniuses over, over time. Um, okay, now onto a slightly different uh, topic. Celebrity, success and genius, which are you? Uh, first of all, what is a celebrity? We have that word in English. Um, and we could all think about it uh, and think about that in, in terms of the foregoing definition. Does a celebrity really change society or does a celebrity simply enjoy the spotlight for a moment and change nothing? It may be luck or serendipity has caused the spotlight to be focused on them and then moves on very quickly. What do celebrities do? Do they enjoy the, the moment? or do they change society? Celebrity versus genius. So we have a little, just for fun here this morning, I have um, a choice that you have to make. You have to vote. And because we are online, we can't see the hands go up very easily. I don't know, uh, Devin, can we see hands go up? Yeah, yeah people can, people can okay. raise their hands. All right. Okay, so we have on the left, and this is American pop culture, but uh, I suspect that the, uh, our participants are conversant with this. So I'm going to proceed. On the left, you have this figure named Lady Gaga. She is a music writer. She is a costume designer. She is a choreographer. She is a parfumier, as they say in Paris, design, uh, creates perfume. She is a, <clears throat> she has a clothing design called the House of Gaga. She's also an actress. She's a, a starring in a movie. I think it's the House of Gucci at the moment, isn't it? Um, in any event, that's uh, one person there on the left. And then on the person on the right, we have Britney Spears. And uh, I need necessarily tell you uh, all the things that Britney Spears has done, but um, <clears throat> she's frequently in the news. And for one period about a month ago, she was in the news, sometimes almost headlines every night on most of the American news channels. All right, so who is the genius here? If you think Lady Gaga is the genius, please raise your hand. Devin's keeping score. Okay, good, we see some votes out there. If you think Britney Spears is the genius, please raise your hand. Okay, more votes. And Devin, what seems to be the consensus? Uh, slight leaning towards Lady Gaga, I think. Okay. Um, I would contend it is Lady Gaga because all the all of the creative impactful things that she has done as a creator. I think the only thing that as she writes her own songs, Britney Spears write covers, does covers. She sings the songs that other people have created. She is not a creator. She is a performer. And we could argue that is a performer a genius? Or is it the person who comes up with the material, the genius? And that's one of the fun aspects of this topic that we can turn it into these discussions. Okay, what is success? Well, we could all me measure success in our own individual way. Is it someone who makes a lot of money? Is it someone who's in the news all the time? Or is it someone who simply in the course of one's life does the best, is the best that they can be, maximizes their potential through the course of their life, is relentless in seeing what they might be in the course of their life? Or is it someone who simply does 
acts of kindness every day to other people to make the world a better place. Maybe you could be a wildly successful individual by every day getting up and just trying your hardest to make the world a better place. Are they mutually exclusive? No, not necessarily. You could be both a success and a, a, gene, and a genius, uh, depending upon how you want to do, define each of them. So what do we do with these two people? Um, this is uh, for those interested in business and finance. We have Warren Buffett, American Warren Buffett on the left, and Jeff Bezos on the right. Um, you may know something about what they have done. Um, and uh, one is an investor, one is an innovator. So judging from what you would know, who would you say is the genius among these two? Who has had the greatest impact among these two? Warren Buffett, please raise your hand. Jeff Bezos, please raise your hand. Uh, what's it look like, Devin? Uh, Jeff Bezos, maybe there's some recency bias here, so, but, but Jeff Bezos, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I would agree with that because these uh, uh, delivery platforms, and I know that you have them in China uh, with Alibaba, for example, and others, these delivery platforms are revolutionary in the United States. People rarely go physically shopping anymore. Shopping malls are in decline because why go there? You can, you can uh, simply get the goods delivered at home. So we know the revolutionary uh, impact of that. Impact, impact is creativity. Um, okay, part two, culture and the notion of genius. Is not our definition of genius culturally dependent? Let's explore that for a moment. In other words, whose genius are we talking about? Whose genius are we talking about here? Now, to um, work through this, I've set up a stairway. And I'm going to think of this stairway. The light is coming in, sort of bothering me here a little bit at the moment as it comes in in my face. Um, maybe, Devin, should I put down my shade just for a second? To Is that distracting to have it? If you'd like. It's, well, it's OK on our end. Whatever okay. makes you more comfortable. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, okay, we'll just keep it as it is for the moment then. Uh, so we have the staircase leading up to the center hall, the hall of fame of genius. Who's gonna, who's the top person here? Who goes at the center most prominent position? It's up to each of us to rank it. So we have Frida Kahlo, Mexican artist, female Mexican artist on the left. Then we have Mozart, then we have Mahatma Gandhi, then Albert Einstein, and we have Tu Yu Yu, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, or close to it at least, uh, on the right. She has won a Nobel Prize. Uh, I believe the first woman from China to win a Nobel Prize for the discovery of a medicine for malaria that, again, like penicillin, is used around the world. Okay, so how are we going to rank these? Well, if you are in China, you might rank them, uh, in living in East Asia, for example, you might rank them something like this, with two you, you at the very top, and Mozart and Einstein, well, maybe down at the bottom. But if you're European and studied music and math, maybe uh, this is your particular ranking. Um, it could go this way with Mozart at the top, then Einstein and on uh, through the sequence. So what do we uh, learn by this? To a degree, we try to make the point that genius is relative to time, to place, and to culture. It's up to each of us to make this decision, and uh, what decision we make will be influenced by where we are, what our personal life experience has been, and the people that surround us. Now, on the screen, you can see, I just put this up there. Devin knows this. We worked our slideshow a couple of days ago, and this wasn't there. <laughs> so, um, uh, a hypothetical list, hypothetical li list of notions about culture and attitudes towards exceptional human accomplishment. It is entirely hypothetical. It is entirely just one person's opinion. And it's one person's opinion, perhaps based on not much information. So I claim no uh, rightness, correctness about any of this. 
I'm teeing this up here, as we say, in order to maybe engender discussion. And I think we will come back, hope we will come back to this at the end of the session today. But we could see that historically, we, one might make a point based on my study of genius as written in this particular book, that Western societies emphasize natural gifts whereas Eastern society, we could say China, I'm not sure because that is obviously my model here. So let me say China, that, that maybe hard work has more importance there. And as I mentioned to um, Devin the other day when we were talking about this, I was surprised with my Chinese students who study at Yale, who, uh, who have pointed out to me that people in China rarely have thought about Nikola Tesla. The only time they hear about Tesla is Elon Musk in a car called Tesla. Um, but Thomas Edison is held in very high esteem because of his famous saying, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. It's all hard work. There is obviously a very different approach to education and gifted programs. The United States tends to uh, test out very early on, give people put them in gifted programs. I read that in China, it's more a question of working and becoming educated and then revealing yourself to be gifted in that fashion. Education is different. It's much less well structured in the United States, sort of free form uh, education in China from what I read is highly organized and very much test oriented. Um, it, it, the Western mode tends to favor, although this is a recent development from the 18th century on, individual um, intellectual property with copyrights and patents. It hadn't always been this way. Again, only uh, with 18th century Western philosophy does this come into play. Whereas in China, from what I read, it's more a question of collective ownership. And I've also read that there was no such thing as a Chinese uh, office of patents until 1980, whereas there had been one in England and the United States since the 18th century. Innovation as opposed to the tradition of, uh, of honoring tradition and homage to the past. I think it's fair to say at, at the moment, at least in recent times, innovation uh, uh, is more thought of in, in the West than the homage to tradition. Uh, there's a Chinese artist, I don't wanna mispronounce it. Let's take by way of example, Pablo Picasso, two famous artists of the 20th century here, Picasso and Chang Dai Chen, both well known, um, uh, but with very different approaches to art. One radically innovative, always changing things, blowing up things, the other uh, showing the, the beauty of life by replicating the, the tradition of the Chinese culture. I think it's fair to say also in recent times, the United States is more of a percolating bottom up to top, whereas the Chinese structure, both governmentally and in terms of ideas, tends to go top to down. Uh, in the United States, as we know, and we saw this uh, during the recent COVID crisis, uh, chaos. It's chaotic. It's, it, it, democracies are hugely uh, chaotic. Um, it's just poorly managed crisis for the most part. Whereas in uh, far Eastern societies, there is an opportunity for, or th there is perhaps more governmental control and therefore more predictability. Freedom of expression versus uniform control of the media. Great financial incentive. I would say there's great financial incentive in China also. Um, there are a lot of very wealthy people in, in China. Um, uh, so that there must be some financial incentives uh, there somewhere. A genius tends to be thought of in the West as turns the arts as painters and musicians and writers and things like that, where I read that in China, it may be more practical in terms of maybe uh, scientists, um, engineers, politicians, that they tend to be, because they immediately impact society, they tend to be more um, significant. So those are just some ideas. It's one person's thought by if you if I wanted to present for you a topic for um, inflammatory conversation, that a list such as this might do it. 
And having set that up now, we'll save that perhaps if you would like to discuss that at the end, we'll, we'll come back to this list. I have this slide again, and we can discuss it in our chat session Q&A at the end. Okay, part three, habits of genius. All right, so now I'm going to back along here, some of the aspects of, of the book and some of the things that we have talked about before, the whole idea of success versus uh, genius. Uh, somebody that is really very fluent and talented in what they do and do well, as opposed to somebody that changes the world. And again, this is question, this is just a chart here for the discussion later on. People with a high IQ, well, yes, to be successful, you have to be smart, I think. Um, but what does it mean to be smart, to have a high IQ? Was some of these people, such as Picasso, Western heroes, Picasso, Beethoven, uh, Darwin, actually did very poorly in school and probably would not have scored at all well on a standardized IQ test or an SAT test or the Gaokao. They would have failed miserably. And you have one famous Chinese entrepreneur uh, who uh, I'm told failed miserably the first two times he took the Gaokao, uh, but nonetheless was able to go on and revolutionize uh, uh, the world of uh, commerce in, in China. And it's a very interesting story. Uh, excellent grades in school. A yes, usually, but not necessarily with the geniuses. A goes to the best schools. Yes, usually with a successful person, varies with the genius. Sometimes they drop out of school. Um, who are famous uh, people today uh, that dropped out of school? Jeff Zuckerberg dropped out of uh, school. Uh, Bill Gates dropped out of uh, Harvard. Uh, Steve Jobs dropped out of Reed College. Richard Branson never even went to college. So um, the schools are more marginal. It's not, you're not necessarily out of the picture if you don't go to the best school, if you have other personal traits that will allow you to transform the world. How important are mentors? How important are things such as curiosity, passion, hard work, imagination? Um, and on we could go. Well, these are some of the points that I talk about in the book. I put this slide up again at the end. We may come back to these, and I would be interested in your opinion about this as we proceed. Now, in my book, uh, I talk about these particular uh, t topics, nature versus nurture, IQ versus emotional quotients, and dealing with people. I talk about the hugely important subject of getting women in the game of genius. We as collectively across the world have wasted half of human capital by excluding approximately 49% of the population by not giving them this education and the opportunity to get in the game of transforming the world. Uh, I, I make the point in one chapter about Prodigies are overrated. Imagination is hugely important. Curiosity is hugely important. Passion is important and so on. Um, but we have only a short amount of time today. So I'm going to uh, emphasize just three of these or spend the rest of the time on just three of these. Curiosity, passion, and creativity with regard to relaxation. So let me start here with curiosity. Now, uh, oh, I guess about 75 years ago, 80 years ago, uh, there was a, a wife of American President Eleanor Roosevelt who said a very interesting thing about curiosity and I'll quote it here. I think at a child's birth, if a mother could ask a fairy godmother to endow it with the most useful gift, that gift would be curiosity. That's a very interesting point, because it seems to imply that curiosity comes with birth. It's a natural gift rather than something you can acquire over time. And I'm not sure what it, the truth of that. I think there's a little bit of truth in both positions there. Uh, with my four children, I've seen some hugely curious and <laughs> others frighteningly uncurious. Uh, how does this happen with the same children, one wonders. So uh, to a degree, it is, I think, genetic. But I think there are also many things that you can do. And I think I'm a practitioner of this myself, is to be fearless 
don't be fearful, be fearless, and be curious. Now, here's what Jeff Bezos said uh, uh, about curiosity. I think it's probably a survival skill that we remain curious and like to explore. Our ancestors who were incurious and failed to explore probably didn't live as long as the ones who were looking over the next mountain range to see if they were if there were more sources of food and better climates and so on and so on. That also is a very interesting notion. Is curiosity, and maybe humans are particularly gifted with curiosity, is curiosity an evolutionary survival instinct? If you are not curious, you are and figure out a solution to the problem, your uh, species is not going to survive or your part of a particular species is not going to survive. And that's an interesting idea as well. Albert Einstein uh, had many interesting things to say about curiosity. Here are just three. Quote, my curiosity is interfering with my work. That just happened to me yesterday morning. And I bet it happens to everybody. You're supposed to be writing a chapter or writing some material for a discussion. And you go to look up something. Wow, that's interesting. And that causes you to look up something else. That's interesting. I had no idea. And then, and then off you go in about an hour and a half. Oh, I'm supposed to be working on this. So your curiosity takes you away from uh, the, the work. So Einstein was aware of that. Here's what he said, tying together passion and curiosity. I have no special talents. They was, oh, Einstein, you're a genius. We'd say, I am, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. He said that, in effect, that was his one talent. He was passionately curious. All right, well, we can move on from that. So geniuses are curious, but also I think so are successes. Um, and I've noticed over time that they, this is the one area where I see an absolute commonality between success and genius, that geniuses and successful pe people are voracious readers. They read everything. Um, and you probably, you may be very busy with your life. It may be the, not the best time in your life to do a lot of reading. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not teaching full time anymore. Um, so I have a lot of time and I spend almost all of it reading. So it may be time dependent in your life cycle, but it's hugely important because it will teach you how to teach your, yourself. And that is what uh, colleges should be teaching. And it took me a long time to realize that it's the one thing that colleges almost never explicitly say. We are here to teach you how to teach yourself for a lifetime. We are here to teach you how to become an autodidact, learn to teach yourself. Colleges should do a better job, myself included, should do a better job of that. Curiosity and passion. Remember what Einstein said, I am only passionately curious. Um, with some people, they seem to um, immediately, immediately uh, know what their passion for life is going to be. With Mozart, it was music. With Picasso, it was painting. With Einstein, it was science. But there's so many other people, Vincent van Gogh, Paul Gauguin, the composer Giuseppe Verdi, that they were in middle age or later when they found out really what their passion was and or, or did their best work. Um, with Here's a thought for younger people in our midst. When you have that, how do you find your passion? Everybody says, you know, when you go to a commencement speech and the speaker would say, follow your passion. Well, you're 21 years old. You don't, what 21 years year old knows what their passion is? They got to maybe pay off student debt or get a job. Your parents are saying, get a job, become a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. But maybe that's not what your passion is. How do you how do you find your passion? Well, here's a thought: when you go out and you get that first job, don't think about the benefits or the salary. And my wife and I have argued with our children, counseling them over time. Don't think about the benefits and salary. Think about, or the amount of safety. Think of it as a young person. Think about the amount of responsibility that you are given, the opportunity to fail, to make mistakes, which, and, and come back from those mistakes, and the opportunity to travel and to learn. Those are hugely important. Responsibility and opportunity to learn. Don't worry about that salary and benefits. You'll catch up. If you do the other, you'll catch up eventually. Um, if you're older, such as I am, and you've made your pile of money, maybe then set up some kind of nonprofit. 
um, organization or activity and where you can have a vision of how to solve a problem and solve it for the rest of us and throw your talent and your resources behind uh, that, uh, uh, finding a solution to that problem. So let's say you're one of these older people and you've, you're now at the other end of the spectrum and you're retired. I've noticed that these geniuses never retire. It's almost a, a joke. Uh, one asked, uh, someone, a reporter once asked Einstein, excuse me, Edison, Thomas Edison, Mr. Edison, when are you going to retire? He said, retire? I'm never going to retire. Work has made life an earthly paradise for me. Work has made life an earthly paradise uh, for me. They never retire. They're passionate. They think they can fix the world. And they're obsessive about doing that. And that's what gets them uh, up and out of bed every day. Which are genius? Are they optimists or pessimists? Which do you think you are? I'd like to ask Devin, are you an optimist or <laughs> a pessimist? Here, we each of us would probably have our own opinion there. But here is a figure that's uh, in the news these days for the, uh, as the creator of Facebook. Um, it's under scrutiny in the United States in various sorts of ways. But I think Mark Zuckerberg made an interesting point here. Optimists, optimists versus pessimists. Optimists tend to be successful and pessimists tend to be right. If you think something is going to be terrible and it's going to fail, then you're going to look for the data points to prove you right. That's what pessimists do. But if you think that something is possible, then you're going to try to find the way to make it to make it work. Making it work versus it can't work. Here are all the reasons it can't work. Find the reasons maybe that it can work. Who lives longer? What would you imagine? Think about that for a moment. Who lives longer, optimists or pessimists? Well, people, uh, psychologists have done studies on this. There's a recent one here, Harvard, Boston University, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, so it must be good. When individuals were compared based on their initial levels of optimism, the researchers found that the most optimistic men and women demonstrate on average an 11 to 15 percent longer lifespan and 50 to 70 percent greater odds of reaching 85 years old compared to the least optimistic groups. And I've done my own statistics on this. I, they are there in the book. But geniuses, it's often said, well, geniuses die young. Mozart died young. Schubert died young. Rocker, Kurt Kobe, he died young. But if you actually do the numbers, they outlive these geniuses. They rank, they make a list of a 200 top geniuses across the world. They outlive the average person by about a decade. It's because they're passionate. They've got, they've got something to get out of bed for and fight for and work for. And they're engaged and alive for that reason. So takeaway here is get a passion. And remember what Confucius is reputed to have said, find a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. That's really quite true, I think. Make, make your passion your joy in life. But ironically, this idea of passion and joy starts with pain. Now that sounds like a crazy idea, but if you look at the English word passion, at the root of that is a Latin word, passio, passionis. It's a, a noun, passion, pain. That's what it means. That's why you have the passion, St. Mark's passion, passion, the crucifixion on, on uh, Good Friday. Um, so uh, this is what Frida Kahlo said about passion. Passion is the bridge that takes you from pain to change. Well, what do we mean by pain there? Well, I was never really sure until I bumped into a couple of, of comments by people such, again, Jeff Bezos, who said, it's, I have this creative discontent. That's the pain, the discontent, but it's creative. I'm unhappy with something. Bezos probably was unhappy that shopping was a very inefficient way of doing business. You would drive to that store. You couldn't exactly find the color shirt that you wanted. So you'd have to get in your car and drive over here or take a subway and go over here to another store to find it. And you couldn't find it there. It's a very inefficient way of business. This annoyed him. We can do things better. Uh, with with penicillin. There's no reason for people to die if they get this little inf infection. We can fix this. Um, that annoyed Fleming. 
that people were dying before a lack of what we now call an antibiotic. So they were passionately discontent. Uh, and they worked hard to create that, to bring an equilibrium, to remove that discontent. Hard work. They worked hard to do that. But is not, is not hard work simply an external manifestation of a passion? You have an internal passion that drives you, and you show that by working very, very hard. Finally, we're going to go on here to the idea of how insights happen, how we get that creative idea. When do we have that stroke of genius? How to set yourself up to have a, an insight, an impactful insight? Well, strangely, you do it when you are relaxed and combining things. Relaxation is important here. Here's what Steve Jobs said about this moment in which thing, ideas are combined in a creative fashion. This light bulb goes on, this great insight comes to you. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they say, I just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. That's because they were able to connect experiences they've had and to synthesize, to synthesize, to bring together new things. How do you combine new things? What kind of mind state or mentality do you have to get into? How do you tap into your subconscious where all these ideas are actually lurking and stored? If you could only bring them together, you relax, strangely enough. And there's a good scientific basis behind all of this. We are only now with neuroimaging and with pharmaceuticals coming to realize. Okay, how do you relax to put yourself in a mind state where you can have a creative insight? Through dreaming and sleeping, through daydreaming, through baths and showers listening to music, exercising, maybe even riding on a vehicle, such as riding on a rocking train. Meditation is possible. An experience in nature where you go out and begin to look and begin to be subsumed by the awe and the grandeur of nature by play, by uh, mundane chores. There are ways that you can put yourself in a mindset, in a mindful mindset by doing mundane chores. We'll talk about that in a minute. And by telling a joke, because humor actually relaxes us, which allows us to be even more creative. Dream your way to a genius. Well, I've been keeping the list here, and this is by no means, I, I see I forgot to put Einstein on this particular slide. Uh, all of the people that have said the great ideas came to them in a dream. Uh, Coleridge was a poet, Beethoven a musician, of course, Shelley a, a writer, Wagner a musician, Jimi Hendrix, rock musician, Billy Joel down at the bottom, rock musician, Yoyoi Kusama, Japanese uh, female artist, very influential around the world, Paul McCartney, um, Ch uh, Chinese descent architect, famous architect, a really wonderful architect, think Pyramid in the Louvre, uh, I am Pei, and American baseball uh, manager Dusty Baker just recently said they said they had these dreams and that great ideas came to them in the course of a, of a dream. One of the most famous examples of, of this is Paul McCartney and the creation of the song Yesterday. And there's a whole literature uh, about this, about how this particular song came to be. And it's a fascinating thing and it's discussed in his new book called The Lyrics, which has been published where he publishes all the poetry of his Beatle, of his song creations over, over the years. And he ends up at the discussion and in interview of this. So he says, I have to believe in the magic. I have to believe in the magic of dreams. But these geniuses sleep with notepads. When you're asleep, how many of you next to your nightstand or on your nightstand there have a piece of paper and uh, a pen or a little notebook and a pen you can scribble down some ideas well here are just a few people that did this i am pay otto lewis um jimmy hendrix dusty baker Kusama. let me focus here on one character that you would not uh you probably have never heard of because i had never heard of him until i started researching this a german chemist named otto lewis louis he had a dream, he says here in 1921, he had a dream about how he could do an experiment that had to do with the trans, 
a transfer of electronic impulses from the sinus node in the heart, sinus up slightly above the heart into the heart, driving electrical impulses. And how would we do this? And he was working with a chemical called, it can't be called acetylcholine, acetylcholine. So he has this dream and he says, that's how you do it. And he wrote it down on a piece of paper. And he woke up in the morning and he couldn't read his handwriting. But he'd been obsessing about this particular problem for 17 years. He goes back to sleep. He wakes up. He's got the same dream. That's it. That's how you do it. This time he doesn't write it down. He gets out of bed. He races to his lab and executes the experiment. Now, this might sound a little bit crazy, but what, we, what we're dealing with here is electronic impulses from this sinus node to your heart. And it's very, very important because if it doesn't get that message, this rhythm is not going to go across and your heart is not going to beat properly and you are going to die. So on the basis of this, we now have these things called Medtronic loop recorders that get implanted in your chest. We have Apple watches. We have these Fitbits. In extreme cases, we have pacemakers. And it all started, this huge scientific breakthrough with the set of colon started with a dream. So go to sleep, but when you have that dream, write it down, <laughs> don't lose it. How many of you, thinking of dreams, how many of you when, you, when you dream, you wake up in the morning and you might be having a very vivid dream, right? And you wake up in the morning and it's so live. And then about, I mean, a minute or so later, it's that dream has disappeared. Well, a dream is just like an insight or an idea. It's going to disappear unless you dry it down, because the process of creating that dream and the process of coming upon that scientific solution are pretty much the same, chemically and neurologically. Okay, when do you get your best idea? Well, uh, okay, so that minute has gone by, you are now, A, um, concentrating a heart, or uh, taking a shower, uh, concentrating hard at your desk, um, or do you come up with your ideas when suddenly called upon in a class or a meeting? I would imagine, Devin, you take this one. Where, where do you get your best ideas? Definitely not C. So <laughs> thank you for <laughs> calling. I would agree. That that's <laughs> when you get your worst idea because you're in these constraints. The fight or flight mode is up, right? And you can't think. You can't think of all the ideas that are really out there because you've got these constraints. It's either run or fight. Um, so what would you say? Uh, yeah, probably the shower. Yeah, and, and people the people have done uh, uh, surveys of this, and they said, you know, here it is, 72% of Americans at least get their best ideas in the shower. They tend to be morning showers, uh, um, and uh, if it's a morning shower, there's a reason those ideas are there, because it takes that set of colon about 20 minutes to completely wash out of your system. Uh, those neurochemicals are switching around as we go from one set of neurochemicals to another. Okay, another way of, of, uh, of coming into a creative mindset is to walk a lot. Uh, it does the same kind of thing. Uh, all of the hundreds and hundreds of people we could list here that uh, have said that they get wonderful ideas if they simply get out there and walk and relax and get in the flow of the pulse of the walking. You can get in a kind of flow, and you could probably do this in China because the rail system is so wonderful that you can probably get into a flow by just being on a train. I noticed last time I was on a train going from New Haven to New York, about half the people on the train were asleep. They had dozed off. They were probably kind of soporific, somnambulous, somewhere in a kind of semi-sleep state, which is a very good state to be in if you want to come up with good ideas. Uh, but again, you might want to write down some of those ideas. Here's another strange thing that I've noticed reading about the lives of these geniuses. Here's what Toni Morrison, who won American author, uh, who won a Nobel Prize for literature, said that she would brood thinking of ideas while mowing a lawn in Queens, New York, in her house in Queens, mowing a lawn. You simply go, I don't know if you have, do that in China or not, but you push this machine, uh, you push this, and you simply walk and turn, push, walk, turn, and you just go around, and it take, may take an hour to do that. And it's very boring. It's just repetitious. It's mindless repetitious. But what happens, you start dream, daydreaming your mind starts to wander in a productive way. It's almost a sleep state. George Balanchine said, he's a famous choreographer, when I'm ironing, that's when I do most of my work. Grant Word, who was an American painter said, 
uh, but he came from Iowa, which is an agricultural center. All the good ideas I've ever had came while I was milking a cow. So once again, uh, some takeaways here. Keep that pen and paper handy uh, uh, near you. This is mine from my master bathroom. Uh, don't get out of bed when you first wake up in the morning. You want to be productive in your life. Don't get out of bed. Wake up and take sort of build into your cycle 20 minutes, 15 minutes where you just sit there and you'll think because you're probably the best thinking that you're going to do that day in terms of the neurochemistry of your body and of your brain is that particular time slot. So you can be most productive, I would argue, just by staying in bed earlier on. Okay, so when you listen to music, that can relax you, that can be very good, but don't listen to the lyrics. Don't and just kind of go with the pulse of the rhythm of the music in a mindless way. When you're exercising, we've got all these gadgets called Fitbits and things, but don't look at that. We don't want to be thinking about push, push, push. Oh, I'm behind schedule here. I've got to go faster. No, that's not what we want to do. Just go to a nice leisurely pace, get in and be relaxed, get in this pulse, and it will then free up your mind to get into a different sort of mindset. Uh, other things you could do, you could vacuum. <laughs> that's, that's kind of repetitious and mindless. You could do the ironing, uh, as George Balanchine said, or you could buy a cow, but that's kind of impractical. That's not going to, going to work. Get a passion is another thing you can do. Here's my, here, I'm getting toward the end here. This, uh, my, one of my favorite quotes in life, the secret to life, and this is the British sculptor, Henry Moore. There's a, one of his sculptors behind us here. Secret of life, Henry Moore lived to be 88. The secret of life, he said, is to have a task, a job, a passion, something you devote your entire life to. You bring, uh, to, uh, you bring something, you bring everything to every minute of every day for the rest of your life. And the most important thing is, it must be something that you cannot possibly do. <laughs> So that, of course, is ironic. It's an oxymoron. It's a paradox uh, from uh, having to do with contrarian thinking, and it's the basis of all humor. But again, remember, humor brings laughter into the world, and when we laugh, science, uh, the psychologists have done studies, with, we become more creative. Relaxation drives creativity. We become more creative. So I'm going to tell you a joke here to make you more creative. What do you call a genius who is not a genius? An oxymoron. And if that didn't work, Devin's not laughing enough. I need, I, I, I need, okay. What the world needs is more geniuses with humility. There's so few of us left. Again, another oxymoron. But okay, I hope that made you laugh. I hope that made you, uh, uh, made you creative. And I'm going to stop the share, I think, here for a moment. And now we'll open up things to, um, um, and maybe we can go back to that slide and uh, we'll see, but we'll open things for uh, discussion. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so okay. many great insights, such as buy a cow, oh. go to sleep, stay in bed. <laughs> Um, uh, we are, uh, technically a little over time, but I think if you're, yeah, I'm very to... sorry. It went much longer than I thought. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. It was, it was worth it. Um, but if you're willing to, uh, maybe stay for a couple questions, um, if that's okay with you. Oh, I'll be here forever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm so, not going anywhere. No. Yeah. So anybody that, uh, would like to ask a question, please feel free to type uh, your question out in the chat box or go ahead and just raise your hand um, and we can start having some uh, interaction. Um, great. Uh, uh, we do have a hand from one way. So, okay. No, okay, you can talk. Hello, Professor. How do you can be genius? 
Um, thank you, uh, Wen Wei, for joining us. And thank you for that question. You'll have to repeat it. Maybe your mom can repeat it for me so I can hear it just a little more clearly. Yeah, you can see again. Let me see again. Uh, hello, Professor. How can kids be genius? Uh, she said, uh, hello, Professor. How kids can be genius? How kids, how kids can be genius? How kids, um, how can kids be geniuses yes. by not paying attention to what their parents tell them? <laughs> by not paying attention to what their parents tell them, by being contrarian, by being independent, by not getting put in boxes and typecast too early in the mind to conform to a model of what their parents think they can be. A famous architect, Buckminster Fuller, once says, um, how, does the, how does the caterpillar know that one day he or she will be a beautiful butterfly? Uh, so it takes time and we don't want you to get typecast too, uh, too early. So be, don't be afraid to be independent, male or female. You can say thank you. 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 And if you look at, as I was saying, we could make a very illustrious list of geniuses who didn't think that their, their vision was being served by their educational experience. Einstein had a terrible time uh, in school, particularly in college. Uh, he, uh, because he was put in one mode of thinking and he could see that things were other than, than that. I think what, but more practically, um, that's a big risk to drop out because 98% of people who drop out of college are simply dropouts. They are not, they don't change the world. Let's be honest here. Let's be direct. We're not, by dropping out, that doesn't make you a genius. Um, that may probably make one thing we can be sure of is that makes you a dropout. Uh, so uh, you have to, but I, I would believe that it is possible for people productively to drop out of. I think there are so pe some people so far ahead that they see that the education in the context in which they are put is not going to serve their interests. I'm going to brag about one grandchild I have who I think falls in that category. I would not say that about my, all of my children or grandchildren, but I think occasionally that happens that you run into somebody whose uh, opportunity, whose educational a context is not being uh, served, or is not providing wealth for the development of that individual. But there's probably a middle ground that could be taken there. You probably develop extracurricular interests that allow you to explore, and particularly in colleges and schools, see if you can't carve out independent studies. Uh, Yale has an opportunity for that. Uh, and some of you on the call can speak to that. Uh, maybe you've taken it through one major or another an independent study. That is the best way to, um, uh, to do that. There used to be a program at Yale called Scholar of the House. I don't know whether they still have that anymore, where one person in a college, one or two people in a college would be allowed to do nothing except follow their passion for an entire year um, and then meet with a, an advisor periodically. So look for those sorts of uh, uh, opportunities for independent study. Great. Um, Joan in the chat also uh, I will say that Joan very, very uh, succinctly summarized ideas for creativity with the three Bs, which is bed, bus, and bath, um, as as the ways that uh, that you can relax. I, I miss. I'm sorry. Say that again, uh, Devin. Bed, oh, bed, bus, and bath. So three Bs to summarize ways to relax and have time. Okay, so the bus is the motion. Yeah. So like a, like a train, bed mm -hmm. is you know, going to sleep and then bath. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's great. 
but Joan also has a, a, an interesting question, which I believe your book does cover, which is what do you think of luck? What is the role of luck in the importance of a genius? I think a lot about this, and I had a very interesting conversation with Roger McNamee, who is a tech guru from Silicon Valley, uh, founder of Silver Lake Partners, uh, uh, Elevation Partners, uh, to be direct a billionaire. Um, uh, just about uh, on Monday, we talked for an hour about this. We have slightly different opinions on on this. Um, I think it's it's a very important issue, um, but I'm a big proponent of you make your luck in life, that um, luck is just preparation going to meet the moment of opportunity, preparation going to meet the moment of opportunity, that you, in McNamee's case, um, he said, well, it was just luck that an investment house appointed him to be in charge of a tech division. Uh, well, it wasn't entirely luck because it turned out he had studied electrical engineering while he was in college. He was prepared and he could have said, well, I don't really think I can do that. I, I, I'd like to do something else. He accepted that challenge. Maybe he had the self-confidence to know that he could do that. That's a form of preparation that may come from failure over time. I think we, we learn uh, in uh, independent thinking and we learn self-confidence through, ironically, through failing because we learn far more from failure in life, I believe, than we do from success. Success, we just kind of... I think the idea of you have to prepare yourself for luck. And I've said another thing that I say in that chapter on luck is you have to move. That's a strange thing to say that if you want to be lucky, you have to make your own luck. And these geniuses do something which really surprised me. I had no idea that this happened. They move to a large metropolitan area of significance or they move to a university center because that's where smart people are with ideas. That's where ideas can be freely exchanged, we hope, in a, in a free, free intellectual environment. And <clears throat> where the best mind, the best competition is, collegiality that pushes things all together forward. So moving to gain situational advantage, you might not be aware of that you're, that you're putting yourself in, along a path to be lucky by moving to a metropolitan center. But that's something that I, I think it perhaps proved to be true. How much that will prove to be true at the moment after the pandemic and with the advent of things that, such as we are using to say Zoom, where we are not physically together, but come together electronically remains to be seen, whether it will be as necessary to move for situational advantage in the future, I really don't know. Great, I wanna to get to some of the people that uh, have been patiently waiting with their hands up. Uh, Amy? Um, hi, Professor Wright. Uh, thank you for your interesting lecture. So you mentioned that um, Western society usually uh, like they tend to connect genius more toward um, the aesthetic field. Well, um, Eastern society usually um, focus more on science. Science, so like um, I'm interested in, like, what are some factors that you think might have caused this difference? Uh, it's history. It is history as to how the term genius developed in Western culture. I don't know how it developed in Eastern culture. So, but I can say with confidence that when people in the West started to talk about genius, and particularly in the early 18th century, the, only, the geniuses that they would recognize, and I see Alan with his hand out, out there, we got to get to Alan. Um, the geniuses that they would recognize were all artists. They were principally poets and writers. And the person who above all else was their model was Shakespeare. And it was only until the 19th century that people began to recognize that we had a term called science at all. It was called natural philosophy up to that point. And then it became to be called uh, the Latin science to know science. Um, and at that point, people who were in the sciences, such as Faraday 
and John Clerk Maxwell came to be recognized as geniuses. So it's only as a matter of history that we in the West, we've always, we started with thinking uh, back with the, uh, the ancient Greeks and Homer, Homer was the model for the Greeks of the genius. Shakespeare was the model for more Western uh, uh, in English and English language thinking. And then only in the 19th century were scientists even recognized was it even recognized as being possible to be a genius and be a scientist? So I think the notion that China probably uh, focused, I, I don't know, but possibly focused on the transformative science just earlier on. That, that speculation on my part. I see Alan has a hand up. Can you hear me, Professor? Yes, now we can. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's, uh, it's my pleasure to have this chance to ask you a question. And uh, first of all, I have to say, I'm a student of your fantastic Coursera course, Introduction to Classic Music. <laughs> you must be very, Alan, let me, let me jump in here and say, well, you must be very surprised then to see me here talking about a topic that has nothing to do with music. <laughs> well, oh, I think that's fantastic, actually, uh, my question is related to the music. And, okay, uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So I noticed that you're talking about the genius, and also you're talking about the habits, uh, such as the, you know, taking a shower, and uh, probably people can become creativity uh, when they take a shower in the morning and uh, take a walk and uh, even, you know, take some notes in the bed. Uh, however, I didn't notice that you are talking about the music uh, related to the uh, genius. So my question is, uh, Professor Craig Wright, and uh, how do you uh, talk, uh, How do you think the music and the genius uh, can music can help? Because I personally, after I uh, have listened to your, you know, classical music, and I personally I have uh, practice to learn cello. <laughs> oh, good okay. for you! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and my, you. You know, because I have been 60 years old right now and I learned from the scratch to learn play cello. And uh, I personally love it very much. And so I really, you know, wondering uh, how music can help people. Okay. Is, is that possible for people to get more genius by playing music? Okay. Uh, there, there are many points, there are many points I could talk about uh, in what you've uh, said, Alan. Let me take them, I think, in order. First of all, in that course, I try to teach you how to think and to concentrate on the music and to understand what's going on in the music. That's exactly the opposite of what I was recommending here with regard to genius. Mm -hmm. One is focused concentration that can cause uh, insights and, and great joy and delight because you understand how something works. It's like putting a huge puzzle together. It's delightful to find out how it works. The other is saying, let's use this now only as background music, as a vehicle to carry us elsewhere where we begin to solve problems subconsciously and to create subconsciously. Um, so that's, that's one point there. Uh, the music is very good, I think, particularly sight reading and learning anything new, but it's a slightly different subject than genius. I think it is simply keeping brain cells alive so as to be fully engaged and to not have uh, a degeneration of your neural uh, processes. And sight reading music is particularly good for that because you have to think, think, concentrate, 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 concentrate. Um, so that, that's, that's helpful, but it's a, not necessarily uh, on point to genius. Uh, the final point that I make here, notice with regard to the dream and geniuses there, how many of the geniuses I had on that list were musicians. Stravinsky was there, um, Jimi Hendrix was there, Beethoven was there, um, ba, ba, ba. other people, uh, uh, Keith Richards was there, Billy Joel was there, um, Paul McCartney was there. I named six of them, right? So, so there's a correlation here between genius and music, but a lot of it has to do with this kind of creative thinking that happens subconsciously when you're, you're in a different mindset. Okay, thank you, Alan, for that wonderful question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 
there's a couple questions in the chat box that I'm going to sort of lump together, uh, which is uh, one question was, is a genius born a genius? And another question is, at what age are geniuses identified? Um, and then they also raise the possibility of maybe we don't realize someone's a genius until after their death. Um, so this, great, this kind great of question, question about age and genius and yeah. being recognized. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, early on, we don't, we have these things called prodigies. We have prodigies. And I have a whole chapter in there. And the first question when Wen Wei uh, and her daughter asked the question about, and I answered it with independence. I have a chapter, the third chapter there talks about, in effect, watch out for the prodigy trap. Parents have a tendency to think, oh, my child is so smart, he or she is going to be a prodigy. Now, a prodigies probably are tracking towards successes. And there's a tendency on the part of parents to say, okay, that's a prodigy. She's, a, she's going to be a prodigy as a pianist, or she's going to be a prodigy as a poet or as a painter. And then you put them in this this one box where that's all they can do. Maybe they could be a medical doctor or something or um, a chemist who discovers a neurotransmitter. And they don't know that because they were never given that particular opportunity. So watch out for that. We don't really know who's going to be a genius and still they start to create. They start to change the world. And that doesn't usually happen until late teenage years. I am struck and I continue to be struck by the fact that so much of the creative pop music of the last 75 to 100 years, and maybe forever with Schubert, for example, is written by people, teenagers, late teenagers, into their early 20s. If you think about the Beatles, the best stuff that McCartney and Lennon ever wrote when they were 17, 18, 19 years old. There's a show that's being advertised on television, Jersey Boys. It was a broad, big Broadway musical. That music was written by a 17 to 18 year old. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel, the same, same sort of thing. Kanye West writing great stuff when he's in his early 20s. Uh, Adele, my heavens. <laughs> she just wrote this thing called 30. I mean, this is her third world busting album. Well, let's go back eight years. The stuff that she was doing when she's 20, 21, 22 is extraordinary. Same thing with Lady Gaga. Um, so so it, it, that's, that's the benchmark. But I think it may be, it may be domain dependent. I don't think, for example, that introspective authors that write transformative novels, you have to have a certain worldly experience. You have to know about life and you have to know about people. And that comes with time. So some things such as science and maybe music and math, these are quantitative things, strangely, that there's a right answer and it kind of comes early on. Other sorts of disciplines, maybe painting, maybe introspective analysis, psychoanalysis, that takes time. And it tends to be people who are in the arts, uh, particularly uh, famous authors that come to this later in life. So it, there's no one time when genius manifests. I would say it starts late teenage years and can happen depending upon the discipline throughout one's lifetime. Uh, I see Sophie has her hand up. Hello, Professor. Um, yes, can hi. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, thank you. So um, I have a question. I really like reading and um, listening to audiobooks, but my school has a lot of homework and I have a lot of other studies to do. So my question is, how do I balance between my passion reading and my schoolwork and things like that? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. I think you try to hit a medium level. I might say, well, Sophie, you should, if you want to do both, then don't sleep very much, but that's wrong. Sleep is hugely important for you because all the great things that are happening neurologically and allow your ideas to settle in and allow your emotions to balance out those eight hours of sleep, we're not resting. 
Our brain is working just as hard. It's just working in a different mode. So don't compromise your sleep. And that applies for all of us. Don't compromise your sleep. I think what you <clears throat> have to do to be happy is to understand that the world is not perfect and that you're not going to be able to do everything to a degree that will satisfy you perfectly. You may have to let some of those school tests go. Let's say you get a B plus instead of an A, but you're doing your reading on the side. Don't let your parents tell you, well, that's not good. No more reading for you. Um, I'm not sure that that's the best approach. I would say, okay, and there's a famous Chinese, I got it from him, entrepreneur um, who, for whom I have a great deal of respect who has said, I, he said to his son, I don't care that much about what grades you are getting as long as they're not too bad. The most important thing is that you're taking a diversity of courses and that those are difficult, that those are challenging courses. So challenge yourself, work for diversity, diversity, but don't limit yourself narrowly and expect in some kind of test-driven mechanism to uh, be satisfied with something other than the highest score. I wouldn't worry about the scores so much. That's my personal opinion. That's great. And I think that leads us to the last question, which I think is a good note to leave on, uh, which is coming from Sarah in the chat box. Um, uh, what do you value personally uh, in raising children? Um, and what is a good way to increase the curiosity uh, of, of children? Oh, boy. You know, I've spent a lifetime doing this with four children. And, uh, and I talk, I was on well, yesterday, two of them yesterday talking about this or that. One of them was very serious about that very issue of perfection in life and optimism and pessimism and happiness. Um, first, some observations. When in your life cycle are you the worst parent? When you are most engaged as being a parent. Because as a parent, you're usually a young person, let's say in 20s, 30s, early 40s. It is the most difficult, particularly the 30s. It is the most difficult decade. You are responsible. You're coming up now. You're getting more responsibility in your job. You may have a spouse. That spouse may have a job. You are responsible for a domestic situation. I'm thinking here particularly of women. Responsible for a domestic situation and you have your own professional aspirations and you have these children. It is chaos management. It is just putting out, constantly putting out fires. You don't have time to sit back and analyze what the heck is going on and what would be the best case solution. The only thing that I can uh, suggest here is time is on your side because as these children unfold, they will more or less unfold as they're going to unfold. Um, you will come, to, you will have more time as they go off to school and colleges in particular, you will have the opportunity to uh, have more time to think about the process. And then when you have grandchildren, it's wonderful because then you've got a built-in laboratory for the study of children <laughs> and you can watch them and you can gain play with them and you can set up your own mental experiments with them and well let's do this let's climb up in this tree house let's imagine this let's build let's build this oh why are you reaching for that over there um so it, it's um it, it's a learning experience um so what i've learned is i suppose um I think don't be too judgmental. Don't be too judgmental. Don't try to turn your children into you. Understand that they are all individuals and they're going to unfold in their own individual ways. And just kind of try to assess what that way is and nurture their way rather than having you, they make them conform to your mold. Fantastic. And I think that's a good reminder for all of us about ourselves as well, um, to not give ourselves that pressure. 
Yeah. yeah. Take, we should all just take a deep breath. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, might I say genius. Um, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, we are going to take a group, group picture. So if you're willing to uh, turn on your cameras, um, please do so now. Um, and, and we can uh, all take a picture together. Um, and thank you all for participating. Um, do look forward to the uh, edition coming out in Simplify Chinese, uh, as well as uh, if you are, uh, want to, you can of course buy the English version. Um, and then I believe, uh, Professor Wright, you also have uh, a course coming out on Coursera as well, right? Yeah, um, uh, some thoughts about Genius. It's going to be a second. Uh, Alan mentioned the a Coursera course in classical music. <laughs> it has all been filmed. We are now just simply editing it. It should be available in February or March. It's a, it is an analog. It is a, a second uh, Coursera online course, free, available around the world. Uh, particularly if you have a VPN, free, available around the world um, to everyone 24-7. Uh, and a lot of the issues that I talk, we talked about today with you and your insights are discussed in that Coursera course. So thank you, Devin, for reminding me of that. Yeah. Right. And hopefully in the future, uh, we'll get you back to do uh, uh, something else um, with that Coursera course as well. Great. That'd be lovely. Well, thank you all. It was an honor thank being you, with everybody. you. Thank you. Bye-bye, okay, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.